so suicide's a massive thing in life, like for for the world at the moment, but you know, for New Zealand in general, but especially in the prison population. And um, one of my car offenders was actually my cousin. He's not blood, but I class him as family. And um, a, a very traumatic um, time in there was uh, when he, he committed suicide in there. It was about midnight or something when we found out and uh, Frank heard it and he yelled out. He's like, oh, um, Zach's hung himself. And I was like, and I didn't believe them. And then obviously it was like I started calling out to him like, Zach, Zach, you know, like fucking no response. And I thought that was weird and started thinking, fuck. And I keep calling out, keep calling out. And then realisation had struck that, um, um, my best mate had actually fucking killed himself in there. And uh, I found out and, and then I realised, the realisation struck me and um, that, uh, that my best mate was dead. And uh, I was confined to a cell where I couldn't run up, I couldn't pull him down, I couldn't do shit. But sit there and ponder and think, fuck, you know, that's my, that's my mate, you know, and he's dead. And he, he died in a cell above me which is meant to be heaven looking up, not fucking hell looking down, which instead it was a flip, it was looking up at hell and looking down at heaven, because down looked so much better than up at that current time. I started smashing up my cell, thinking about it, and just like not knowing what was the outcome or even if, you know, the fact you know, that you're never going to see someone again. And... Uh, Everyone was shouting at the screws and they're like, fuck, you have to let him out, you have to let Snake out, you know, he's got to, he's got to be with him, you know, and they're like, nah, we can't, you know, the laws, the fucking regulations and all that stuff, which was understandable, but they let me out anyway. And that, so they unlocked my cell and they cut him down and they left him on the landing up top. And I had to, uh, well, I didn't have to do anything but sit there really and I couldn't go up. I couldn't bring myself to going up and seeing him. So I, <clears throat> I sat down on the, the tables at the bottom looking up, watching him wrapped up in this blanket, dead, lifeless, never look into those eyes again. And then thinking about friends and family that didn't know at this stage that I was with him and not been able to do anything about it. I mean, people die every day, people come and they go, it's life, but in this situation, it's completely different. And ultimately the strain and, and, and the effect, not a, it doesn't just have a mental and emotional and spiritual effect, it has a physical effect because your body's so drained and you're so tired and you're so worn out when, when you lose someone that close to you. At that age, you know, so bloody young, always live a good man and a beautiful life. <sighs> so they let me out there, you back to my cellmate, and I didn't sleep. Just cried. Next day it was it was pretty hard. Um, speaking to his mum on the phone was pretty um it was pretty gut wrenching to talk to her. Uh, and these these are the sides of prison that you know that really test you, you your durability. You know it's it's hard to be versatile when you're in situations like that, and, and it's a place of hostility at times. You know, and it's hard to maintain a cool and keep keep calm and collective, especially with what you go through in there. I went up to court for compassionate bail, got three days out to attend the Tony and the funeral, and that was, it was, yeah, the hardest thing ever. The impact and the emotional waves, the hysteria is what it's close to, because you're so, so down and out and isolated, and you're in a desolate place where you have no choice but to have to deal with something like that without no way of actually dealing with it and to comprehend the weight of that emotion is indescribable unless you feel it. It's not easy for anyone, to be fair. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, I've done what I did. And if we'd never done that, half this shit wouldn't have occurred. But we make mistakes, but we're not mistakes. We have to learn and grow from these mistakes, mistakes to be better people. Because we're only learning. We were kids. As much as people would sit there and judge us and say, oh, this is that, you do the crime, do the time, pay your dues, you debt to society. That's their perspective. They don't know what kind of life we come from. I want to make a difference. I don't want to see people have to go through what I've been through or people that I know what they've been through. Because we've all been through hell on earth.
we've all had issues, we've all had losses, we've all had defeat. Sometimes we face defeat us, but it's up to us to make that change and accept the support that's there. Because we alone must do it, but alone we cannot. And to me that speaks that we have to make the first step and then we can allow those to help us. Because I don't want to see young men killing themselves in jail. I'll always have a soft spot for suicide because of the stuff that's occurred in my life and depression that I've faced. And you know, even, even now I go through it in these times where I want to die, still. It doesn't make it easy, but I know I've got to carry on.